All right, so, uh, so I hope all of you got the email for uh, the, this particular uh, assignment. And uh, I have two problems in this assignment, which uh, 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 count towards uh, uh, sort of a prelim. They need a little bit more work, I would say, that uh, 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 I think I promised that I will ask you this question. And here it is, basically about dynamic uh, scattering uh, and uh, um, um, so, so uh, actually, have you uh, or who, uh, who of you have covered dynamic scattering in other courses? Okay. Temperature dependent effects of scattering. None. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, so uh, at least the basic problem should be relatively uh, straightforward. Essentially, we are uh, saying that you don't have a perfect crystal, right? And uh, because of thermal vibrations, uh, uh, the lattice points themselves are moving. And uh, how is it then even in spite of that, you can get a diffraction pattern and all that. So, and uh, not just that, you can calculate it uh, 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 and, and, and calculate its effect on temperature. Uh, so I've given you a little uh, uh, a plot of uh, uh, how uh, the intensity peaks start decaying as you increase the temperature, as you would expect the randomness increases. Uh, and then this is real experimental data, uh, and you can try your hand at explaining it. Okay, so uh, basically, you should be able to generate a plot like this you know, so as a function of temperature and all that. Right? Uh, the second thing is uh, I've asked you here to uh, part C here is to redo, uh, you know, this uh, initially you can do it for three dimensions, uh, but I asked you to kind of redo it for 1D, uh, which is a, a problem that you have solved earlier in this assignment. Uh, but uh, uh, this is somewhat of an open-ended problem, meaning the first shot at it, you can easily ex analytically get a formula. But uh, to make intuitive sense and physical sense is very tricky. In fact, this is a very interesting problem, still uh, meaning uh, the, the debye waller factor, the structure factor uh, as a function of temperature for low dimensions, Go, going from 3D to 2D to 1D. Uh, it's a very interesting problem tra tracing back to 60s and 70s when people realized that uh, for low dimensions you have some instabilities, you know? so, so especially if you solve the problem in its full quantum mechanical you know, glory, meaning you don't neglect things like zero point vibration and you know, all that stuff, then uh, uh, essentially uh, what the theory sort of predicts is because of thermal vibrations, you won't have stability of the crystal to start with and all that. You know? so, so like 2D crystals cannot exist, quote unquote, and all that. It's not stable. And this comes out from this analysis. You know? I'm not asking you to do it, but if you do it, you know, it's great. So, and if you realize this connection, that's even better. You know? so, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the, this problem is, is basically I've asked, uh, we kind of have covered part of parts of it in the, core, in the class where you're going to look at uh, uh, the paper which is already, it's attached here and hopefully you should be able to completely understand the paper, what it is, reproduce figures and all that. That's how I asked you to do. Yeah. And um, I generally try to get this done in a, in, a, in, a, in a grad course where towards the end you should be reading papers and be comfortable with understanding, not only understanding, generating figures and un completely having a good feel for it. And we are reaching towards the end of the course, so I'll probably ask you to read a few more as well, you know, a couple of more, at least we have only a month left. But uh, it's a starting point, so, so you can actually, should be able to easily generate figures that they have used and they have already described it. I, uh, my, point is really not that you generate the figures as much as you understand what went in there okay? and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, so, so if you remember we were looking at various kinds of cells you know, where you can have one gallium atom, two, three and four and, and what are the fractions b based on uh, you know, temperature and composition. I mean these are the plots here. So. And it has to do with combinatorics and this entropy and enthalpy that we talked about. right? So. Okay, so uh, and uh, what we are talking about now are defect and strain, uh, and, and that's what we are covering right now. And hopefully we'll end up. Okay. Any questions on this? No. So you don't have to turn it, uh, turn in the red problems or the uh, separately. You can turn it in together just in one 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 sheet. Is no nothing separate. Yeah, uh, and I've also asked you to uh, if you look at the 
paper uh, towards the end, it, and we're going to talk about this today as well. So uh, it, it shows uh, quite a few 3,5 alloys, 3,5 compound semiconductor alloys, indium arsenic phosphides, antimonides, you know, gallium arsenide, and all that in gas. And I've asked you to just uh, you know, scan over uh, this little website we had linked in the course, which shows you know, the industry uh, uh, usage of these materials now, and what sort of devices are being used at. So you can just scan and just write a small you know, paragraph or a report or a critique on, on what's going on right now. So, yeah, yeah. OK, so, so uh, any questions on this? All right, uh, if not, let's uh, uh, continue. Uh, we had already st uh, started talking about defects, right, in the last class, what we, what we were talking about. Uh, we spent some time, I think, a couple of lectures talking about point defects. Uh, um, and, and, and what uh, I want to get to today is, is extended defects, which is uh, uh, dislocations and, uh, and such things. But uh, uh, what, I want, what I have not covered much in the class yet is, uh, is, is the aspect of uh, we did talk a little bit about strain when we talked about piezoelectricity and gallium nitride and all that. But now uh, 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 I want to go into a little bit more detail because uh, uh, the, the things like extended defects and dislocations are a result of uh, uh, a competition between, uh, uh, basically they are a result uh, where uh, you know, if, if, you, if you strain something you know, beyond a certain point, you will form some sort of a defect, right? And, uh, these extended defects, cracks, uh, dislocations are all uh, results of strain, right? so, as you might imagine. And uh, what we'll do is, uh, um, actually we can start by looking at, uh, uh, so, so strain is a, a macroscopic concept, right? I mean, you, you have a large lattice and you, you have strain it and all that, but the origins of strain are really microscopic as well. You can, you know, relate it. Uh, track it down to the stretching of and bending of bonds, right? Chemical bonds between atoms. Right? So, so you can track it down. Uh, sometimes you have a top-down approach where you start from the bulk properties and then you get to the microscopic picture. Uh, uh, but uh, what uh, I wanted to do was start from the microscopic picture here and then build it up towards the macroscopic picture and show how uh, uh, the strain energies, uh, how, how do you write down strain energies for, for layers, uh, and uh, how do you find critical thicknesses for formation of dislocations and that sort of thing. So, but uh, what I'm saying is uh, uh, I'm starting from the microscopic picture of strain. Okay, so, and, and I will actually post, I, I uh, realize in, in, in Rocket's book, he doesn't, uh, he actually has uh, this microscopic picture written up very early in the text, but not in the chapter on dislocations. Um, so I will also post a little uh, part of another book where, or a chap part, part of a chapter from another book where you can read this part of this. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, what we'll uh, do is, is uh, uh, motivate, uh, or rather start understanding strain from a microscopic picture. And it's not very complicated, it's very intuitive. And in the end, uh, we want to get, uh, get by with the least number of parameters. And that's what we're going to do with you. So, and it kind of traces back to uh, Linus Pauling and, and, uh, uh, and uh, John Popel and all, all these people who actually, you know, 50s, 60s, and even earlier. Uh, but then uh, the effect of strain on 3.5s is, you know, has been studied over the last two or three decades and even being studied today. So, yeah. so uh, uh, first we start with uh, 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 the the uh, so so let, let, let me first ask, so so for example uh, you know we, we always think of uh, uh, in in typical solid state physics or semiconductor physics courses we always start with a perfect crystal right perfect crystal every atom is in a nice periodic position and and uh, 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 and, and then we start looking at what is the band structure electronic band structure and all that and there's no concept of strain at all in a perfect crystal, right? I mean, uh, right? I mean a, a, a strain crystal can be perfect, but at least what I'm saying is when we study uh, solid state physics and electronic properties, photonic properties, uh, we don't look at a I mean, we don't look at imperfections to start with. Right? And in the last couple of lectures, we started looking at it in you know, vacancies and, and defects and all that. Uh, but what's actually amazing is if you actually have a perfect semiconductor crystal, for example, uh, it won't have the kind of transport that we actually get. You know, I mean, e electrical transport, for example, 
if you have a perfect crystal, uh, you, you will actually end up getting uh, things like block oscillations and all that where there won't be, uh, uh, you know, the traditional uh, or the, 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 uh, me me what we measure are, are uh, resistances related to you know, diffusion and, and drift and, and uh, uh, even ballistic transport in, in, a, in a completely perfect crystal uh, is, you know, once you have contacts and junctions, you don't observe it, right? So, and then, uh, so, so essentially, even the most elementary uh, transport, electrical transport, or, or sometimes even photonic properties, are really not related to the perfect crystal. They are, they depend on defects. Does that make sense? I mean, uh, that, that's kind of an interesting point to look at. Uh, there are obviously some uh, aspects of transport and photonic properties that uh, you can explain from a perfect periodic crystal, but at least conceptually it's simpler to start with a perfect crystal. Right? But one case where the perfect crystal will not even let you, you know, go beyond, uh, ba basically won't let you explain pretty much anything is me our mechanical properties. So the mechanical properties, um, the perfect crystal model basically fails to explain pretty much everything. You know? So you have to have defects and dislocations and points defects to explain even the simplest of mechanical properties. For example, why is something ductile? You know? why, is, why is it that something you can bend something? You know? so, uh, why is it uh, uh, that uh, uh, you drop a piece of, uh, you know, drop your, I, th I think this is a famous statement by Eugen Wigner, who said that uh, if you drop a piece of uh, my key, I know it's not going to shatter into many pieces, but why? You know, can you explain it? And to explain it, you need to understand defects. Because, uh, uh, for example, if you lift up a piece of uh, chalk, you know, you, and, and how is it that the atoms on the other end know that you know, there's a force on this end? This, these problems are not that trivial if you think of it microscopically. It's actually a very hard problem. Uh, and and uh, the fact that uh, you know, there are bending motions and uh, strains and twists and all that shears going on as you move something even, right? Uh, many of them actually depend on the crystal not being perfect. You know? and, 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 uh, uh, so, uh, uh, what we'll s uh, start with is, is look at, uh, uh, and, and what we'll see, uh, also see uh, are things like def I mean, dislocations uh, also enable growth you know, d d during the growth process. Uh, uh, they, they, they introduce uh, places where atoms can have more bonds than it would be normally, you know, and, 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 and then they can actually hasten or fasten the growth rates and all that sort of thing. So uh, there are many things that the defects are doing, and uh, I think one of the most uh, uh, telling statements uh, was, uh, I think, in John Zeeman's book on solid state physics, where he says that disorder is order that we have not understood yet, you know, and that's actually true. Its roles become apparent once you make your materials cleaner and better and you realize that, oh, something that I was uh, expecting, or rather something I was getting for free is now going away because I'm taking away the defects from it. You know? So, so uh, okay, so we'll look at uh, the defects, but first we start with uh, uh, the defect, which is really not much of a defect, but uh, just uh, the alloy disorder, which is, in, it's, you can think of it as a defect and we'll mathematically introduce or at least intuitively introduce what we mean by, uh, uh, you know, uh, strain at a microscopic level, and then build it up into what, how does it translate to macroscopic level, and what is the notion of disorder and defect in this in the in the strain. Okay. So we start with a, a indium, uh, the, our standard thing. We are looking at, uh, let's say, uh, a crystal that has a x, uh, b one minus x, and c. You know, and any any compound semiconductor alloy. Indium gallium arsenide, indium gallium nitride. You know, in general, uh, you could even have silicon germanium for a care right now. Right? So, so it, that would be two, 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 two atoms. And uh, what we uh, start with by saying is, is uh, we, we, let, let's assume we are in a cubic crystal. Uh, and all right, so we are in a cubic crystal. Uh, so, what are we doing? We are doing strain. But it's microscopic picture, uh, you know, microscopics of strain. So, uh, so we are in a cubic crystal now, and uh, uh, so uh, the C atom is sitting in the middle, right? In, uh, let's assume for now, and we are going to uh, look at the tetrahedron. Uh, so, uh, actually, let me. I had a picture here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, th there's a C atom arsenic say, is sitting in the middle, and then you have indium and gallium. So let's say a gallium atom here, 
I think you know this, uh, that uh, for the cubic crystal you have, if it's this way and the other two would be that way, right? So they, they go, if it's this way, the other two are that way. So you have okay, yeah. So you have one here and the other here. Right? So therefore, so this is our uh, 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 you know basically tetrahedron here, if you might, right? So so this is the uh, uh, four group three elements uh, and uh, one group five, but then these are shared with the next one, right? So, so right? Three five. Uh, okay, so so now uh, what we are going to say is is uh, um, if I have all the if I just have gallium arsenide or if I just have indium arsenide, then all the bonds are a certain length, right? All the bonds are a certain length, and there is no strain anywhere. Right? So if if it's a gallium arsenide crystal, there's no strain. It has its own lattice constant. There's no strain. If it's if all the four atoms here are indium then there's no strain, but the moment one is indium and the other three are gallium, or two are indium and the other are gallium, there's something, you know, there, there is some distortion to this now. Does that make sense? I and mean, there must be some distortion, because the gallium arsenide crystal itself, let's specifically talk about in gas, because we're, that's what we're talking about right now, right? Uh, arsenide. So the gallium arsenide crystal itself has its own equilibrium lattice constant, right? And the and the uh, indium arsenide uh, crystal itself has its own uh, equilibrium lattice constant. This is a lattice constant, not the bond length. Bond length is some fraction of the lattice constant. I think you know that much, right? So, uh, and but this whole alloy, uh, uh, what we are going to say, even though it's not okay, we can say that an, on an average, the lattice constant of the alloy would be. Uh, you know, this is a very simple scaling law or Weygaard's law, as you might say. This is on an average, right? There's no, no, no reason to say it, but we are saying, well, it should be something close to that, right? Uh, I'm going to scale linearly between the two, right? And I think you know right away that uh, uh, this may be true on the whole, right? But microscopically, it's not true, right? Microscopically, you know, this thing is looking like Let's say this is indium, let's say this is indium, this is gallium, this is gallium. Microscopically, if my world is this much, then I'm in an indium arsenide crystal, right? Kind of. If I'm in, in this much, I'm in a gallium arsenide crystal. So those bonds, both those bonds, and the fact that they are strongly interacting, right? Meaning they are obviously arsenic is bonded to both, not just, you know, indium or uh, Meaning, uh, that means that uh, the, the lattice constants or the, or the bond lengths here are neither those of indium arsenide nor those of gallium arsenide. That's really what it is. It's deviated from both. Right? And that's intuitive and that's actually uh, what one would expect. Right? Is that clear? At least that's very uh, uh, straightforward picture. Now. So now what we're going to do is look at the length of the chemical bonds uh, between, uh, say, indium and arsenic and gallium and arsenic, let's say. Right? These are the two, two kinds of chemical bonds in this whole crystal. Two kinds, right? In this crystal, there's indium and arsenic and gallium and arsenic. Uh, assuming again there are no vacancies and all that right now, we're not talking about that. Okay? So what we're going to say is, is let's say this bond length here between gallium in the cent center of the gallium atom and the center of the arsenic atom here, the bond length is say d i uh, uh, d uh, let's say you know gallium arsenide uh, zero. Okay, so. Meaning zero means equilibrium. Meaning if it was in a perfect gallium arsenide crystal, okay. it's the bond length. And uh, uh, and what we realize right away, this is the, the bond length in this alloy is clearly not the same. It is either longer or shorter. But obviously you can see because it's indium gallium arsenide, the total lattice constant is larger than that of gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide, right? Indium arsenide, let me just sketch it this way, just as a mnemonic at least. So indium arsenide lattice constant is larger than gallium arsenide. It's obviously exaggerated, but at least that's clear, right? Small lattice constant, large band gap, large lattice constant, small band gap, right? So, so, uh, uh, so, so basically the distance between two atoms, uh, you know, the gallium arsenic bond, the chemical bond length of, you know, the mixture here, 
of Indium Gallium Arsenide is, is longer than Gallium Arsenide and is shorter than Indium Arsenide. That's clear. Right? That, that must be how it must be in, inside the crystal. And uh, uh, so the moment you look at it this way, and now Im imagine that these are masses. I mean, this is uh, the f you know uh, phone phonon picture of something, right? Uh, you have masses, m1, m2, and there's a certain spring constant alpha, right? And you stretch it. Right? Gallium arsenide is stretched out. Indium arsenide is squeezed in, right? So it's a mass spring. So what will be the energy cost? of you know the the the, the deviation from from this this uh, equilibrium from its equilibrium uh, position a right that's that's what we see and uh, this is uh, called uh, this was actually done a long time ago uh, by uh, um, you know John Popel and Keating and Ke you know Paul Ke Keating uh, you know called the Keating model and all that uh, and also by uh, Linus Pauling uh, I think both Popel and Pauling are uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, but uh, for many other things, including this. So they say that, well, it's a very simple picture. You have strain. The strain energy for every such bond is basically like a half kx squared. Right? It's a spring mass system, so it's of, of the order of half, half kx squared. But then what they uh, actually are uh, uh, able to, so if you actually strain it or stretch it, let's say, or, or you know, stretch it or compress it, then the ith, chemical, ith kind of bond, be it a gallium arsenic bond or indium arsenic bond, right, or you know, in some other semiconductor, and then these three by eights and all, I'm not very interested. But this is, uh, you know, how how uh, the coefficients are written. So there's a certain spring constant alpha for each kind of bond, gallium arsenic, and indium arsenic, and all that. And then there is uh, uh, the factor here uh, is uh, the way it's written, uh, you know, is is uh, the difference square over its equilibrium value squared. I mean, uh, what I would say is uh, just think of it as a mass spring system and something like a half kx square, but it's not half, but some alpha and, and some square, length square. You know, that's, that's what it is. And uh, obviously, if you are in your equilibrium uh, bond length, there is no such energy. There's no energy penalty if you're in equilibrium bond length, right? I mean, that's taken care of. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, so this is not not all, and, and, and this is a very important uh, thing. This is not all the energy cost for building this crystal. And this was actually for, uh, this particular fact was first realized by uh, Max Born, you know, one of the uh, inventors of quantum mechanics itself, and also who did a lot of work on phonons and all that. Is uh, the total energy cost is not just the stretching of the bond, but also uh, bending, you know, or, or rotational sort of idea. So, Right. So, so uh, there's a stretch and then there's a bend. You know? so, so there's a R and there's a theta here. Right? So, so. And, max, and that was absolutely essential to explain many very simple fundamental properties of solids. And this will be one of the strain, st strain energy. Uh, bending energy cost is uh, actually, we'll see later when we look at the total energy, the bending energy dominates you know? so it's over, over the stretching energy, though you might think it's smaller. The coefficients would be smaller, and that actually will be the reason it will dominate. Uh, it's like, uh, well, yeah, OK, let, let's get, get there first. So, so the bending energy of each bond, again, it looks like you know, half kx squared as well. But uh, 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 so now uh, the bending energy is written for bond pairs, ij, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, again, so, so there are some coefficients. Here, there's a beta uh, uh, of, of the beta is the bending coefficient or, or the uh, bending spring constant, if you might. And then uh, I think you, you realize at least uh, physically that uh, the, the, the bending uh, uh, is, is given by uh, the angle between the two, is, is, uh, uh, the angular change of the bonds is given by some sort of a cosine theta, right? The angle. And, and so you get a dot product between i's and j's there uh, in the real crystal after the strain minus its equilibrium value dot dj0. Okay. So, so that's the uh, uh, angular uh, difference from a perfect crystal where there is no bending, no stretch. Right? So, uh, the, and, and then square, again, everything has to be length squared. So 
zero, d j zero. That basically, these are the magnitudes of this thing. It's no bending, then uh, you know uh, theta is zero, cosine theta is one, and the difference is zero. Okay. Uh, so so this is these are the two energies uh, related to uh, stretching and bending of chemical bonds in a crystal. So intuitively, or hopefully, this is not not very complicated. And uh, again, I'll uh, I will also post the uh, ch book chapter from this is Jeff Sau's book on MBE growth of three five. So I'll post this as well so on the website. So now, uh, so this is the strain energy cost for each bond. And remember, this is not the total energy of formation of the whole crystal. It's just the cost that you pay or the energy cost that you have to pay in order to create the crystal because of strain. It's just the strain. And then there are other things, you know, chemical bond energies, defects, all that stuff. We're not looking at that. We're looking at primarily strain now because now we're going to go to talk about dislocations and what was the reason for their formation. But we're starting at the atomic level, right? years where strain is born because of stretching and bending of the bonds. And these are the energy scales of it. Uh, so now if you want to write down the uh, total, uh, so this is basically of each, uh, uh, each bond uh, is, is, is this, this much energy cost, and then you want to write it for the whole, you know, this tetrahedron or this cube with four chemical bonds, so you've got to sum it overall, right? The total stretching energy will be the sum over you know, whatever is your system size, and you, you yeah, well, uh, if you have I, uh, if you have four, you sum it over the four elements and all that, right? So, so the four bonds, and similarly, the bend energy, bending, the cost of bending energy is sum of, of each Ij, Ij, but I think you have, just have to be a little careful, don't double count and all that stuff, right? So, so the bending is, uh, is, is, is a pairwise phenomena, so you just have to do that. And uh, in the end, what you do is just uh, the total strain energy, therefore, uh, is, is, you can write it total, but it's written uh, uh, kind of nicely as an idea of a tetrahedron. So this is a tetrahedron. Uh, well, yeah, so I think you can show it's, it. This is a tetrahedron. This is at the... Uh, you know this thing, oh, right? So the total is basically the sum of all these these four terms and all these uh, you know bending terms, and you get some expression here. Just, you know, take these, plug these in, just get some expression. N nothing very uh, complicated, and, and uh, you know when you get these d dot di dot dj's here, you get the cosine thetas, and the thetas are the angles between you know chemical bonds and all that. So so that is very standard. N nothing fancy about them. Right? So now, uh, you can ask, well, what are these alphas? What are these betas? Do I know them? Yes, these are known since, uh, uh, I think, I think 1970s. Uh, Paul, this is from a paper from Paul Martin. Uh, you know, you can choose, if you're looking at indium arsenide, you want your alpha for indium arsenide, uh, you know, this, this, this term, alpha, for the indium arsenic bond. Look at the table, you know, pick up here, here 35.18 newtons per meter. Is the spring constant Newton per meter, right? Yeah, right. And then you can choose. Uh, uh, this particular table was done before gallium nitride, but now I think there are, uh, these have been updated. This is okay. Yeah. Uh, similarly, betas, uh, uh, you know, for, for 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 this beta i and beta j. So if you are looking at gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, uh, you can pick it up from here. Okay. So uh, and and uh, uh, obviously we know also the lattice constants. I think where was the lattice? Let's see. Uh, uh, so it's not very easy, but basically the lattice constants are related to the, uh, that's well known, right? Lattice constants are measured to great accuracy, the equilibrium ones, okay? So now uh, what we are going to do is, is look at the uh, uh, picture and, and say that, uh, well, uh, I understand that, I think it's the second page, uh, this is the total energy cost of, of uh, once I sum up all the stre stretching and the bending and the strain cost, energy cost. What you can do is uh, imagine that, uh, okay, so, so this is, let me write that down, stretch plus bend on the total sum of all that. Right? 
uh, now what you can do is uh, say that, uh, look, I have an alloy which looks like this with a comp mole fraction of indium being x. Right? So indium x, gallium 1 minus x, and awesome. Uh, I can imagine, uh, and then this is a particular example, is, is, this is called a virtual crystal approximation. Right? Very important one for m doing many things, not just strain energy, but we're looking at mobility, scattering, transport, optical properties, uh, uh, bowing parameters. A lot of them depend on this, uh, this kind of a very conceptual approximation. You can imagine that I have a crystal uh, which is neither indium arsenide nor gallium arsenide, but all its bond lengths are exactly that. Right. Does that make sense? It's, it's a virtual crystal where this atom is really not indium and this atom is really not gallium but something else. Right. And, and it's completely homogeneous and its lattice constant or the bond length everywhere is the same. Does that make sense? This is no change as you go from one cell to another. Right? So that's the virtual crystal approximation. And if you had a virtual crystal then uh, 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 the <clears throat> it's pretty easy to find out what is my you know uh, d uh, or, or what is my lattice constant here right I mean that that part is pretty trivial this is basically your virtual crystal for that particular thing right? and you see that the bond length between the gallium and arsenic or indium and arsenic at every chemical bond is different from the virtual crystal because it's neither this nor that. Right? Uh, rather, if you, had, uh, if you have an alloy, then every bond length is different from the virtual crystal. So again, I think I'm saying the same thing again and again, but it's different. Right? So, so that part is very clear. So you can go back and ask that uh, uh, how much is the deviation? So, so let's say you know, that's, that's the z-axis, let's say, and, and uh, you can say that uh, here's my lattice constant on the virtual crystal, right? A, B, C. Right? And say that uh, if I am in, not in the virtual crystal, but if I am actually in the gal indium gallium arsenide alloy, right? What is the bond length of the? Uh, uh, how do I express the bond length of this distorted gallium arsenide chemical bond in terms of the lattice constant of the virtual crystal? So either more or less. Right? That much is clear. And here's how much more or less. This is how it, it turns out being. Right? And these two square root of two factors and all that are ba basically because A is the lattice constant and it's not the distance between the atoms. I think you know that square root of three by fours and all that are just, you know, for our cubic crystal, that's very standard. Not only that, you can write down all your co angle, angle dependencies, cosine of theta, all that, because now you know, you know, where uh, uh, will the bonds, basically if you're st if stretched it and bent it, you also know all the angles. So you can express everything in terms of an unknown z. You know, what is the z? The z is basically the deviation of the arsenic uh, position towards the gallium atoms, meaning z is how much shifted is it from the perfect, uh, from the centroid, right? Or, or at center of this cube. Right? How much is it shifted? And you can see that net result of all this is in the virtual crystal, there's no shift, Z is zero. Right? But in the real indium gallium arsenide crystal, there will be a shift right? because of stretching and bending. Right? And that's what we want to find. That's what we want to find. And you want to write it now because your total energy, strain energy cost is the sum of all this stuff. And now you have strain and you know all these distances. So you can write everything now in terms of only one unknown parameter. And that is this shift, Z. Does that make sense? You can just write everything in terms of this one single unknown, which is Z, which is the shift of the arsenic atom from the center of this cube in the Z direction. By the way, is it clear for this particular crystal it, it can only be in the Z direction by symmetry? Maybe, so maybe think about it. It can only, only be in the Z direction. The way it's, uh, if there was only one indium here, you've got to worry about it. Then it can move out a little bit. But if there's both indiums here and galliums here, then there's reflection symmetries as well. So it can only move in the z direction now, right? In its equilibrium position. And so what you do well uh, is very standard procedure now. You rewrite this now uh, as a function of z, right? And z is unknown, right? And this is the energy cost. And I think you know very well what, how to find the z. You, you take 
uh, uh, you minimize this. It's a function of z. You can plot it as a function of z. Where is the arsenic atom? And then you take <coughs> the straight total energy cost and you minimize it. And that will give you the equilibrium value of where is that arsenic atom in the plane. Right? right? And you get it completely in terms of these alphas, these betas, right, and the equilibrium lattice constants. And, and nothing else. You don't need anything else. Is that clear? Or, you know, so, so. So, uh, so when you do that, uh, you know, and, and here's the z equilibrium you get in terms of alphas and betas and the lattice constants of indium arsenide and gallium arsenide. Right? Yeah. And uh, now, uh, so, so what you can now do is plot this z as a function of, uh, you know, so one of some of these energy scales here, and you see that, uh, uh, so versus uh, within. Uh, so what, what, what it basically is, is showing is, is essentially a, 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 a function of, so this is the total or the actual, here's the virtual crystal approximation, and there is another picture which is called the uh, uh, send, or covalent radius approximation due to Linus Pauling, uh, which uh, uh, is the, shows you the energy cost. Basically, it's a parabola with z. You know. Big, you know, big surprise, it's a harmonic oscillator, so the energy cost will be a parabola with, with the displacement. Right. Uh, but but uh, the slope and all the other uh, curvature is, is is obviously the kind of the important para uh, parameter here, uh, and uh, uh, so and then the units of this sort of this axis here are in electron volts per atom pair, you know, or pair of atoms. And uh, is is this clear? By the way, what we did just now, we just said microscopically, I'm going to look at the smallest unit of any compound semiconductor alloy, and now say that uh, because of Strain energy, there are two kinds of, again, I'm repeating again, two kinds of strain energy. One is stretching, the other is bending. Combine them, find the total energy, right? And then from here, we are able to pull out with basically the known parameters of the solid, which is the alphas and betas and the lattice constants, pull out where should this atom sit. Right? And then, you know, it's a very uh, simple, and it's a harmonic oscillator picture. Right? And now, uh, when you actually ask uh, that, uh, that the... Uh, Mm. Uh, the the uh, so so but in a real alloy, I think you realize that uh, you you won't have just fifty percent. Let's say you're looking at uh, a layer which is fifty percent in gas. Right? Let's say, right? but I think we we know that in a real alloy you'll have some regions that are, you know, ten percent, some regions that are eighty percent. There'll be fluctuations and all that. We know that as well. Right? So so now uh, what we can do is try to build this up. Uh, and, and, and well, okay. Let me step back for a second and say, people have grown these alloys, and there are very careful experiments. Typically, these experiments are called X-ray absorption fine structure, XAFS measurements, with which what you can find out is if I have a indium atom, basically you can find out the bond length of each one of these inside the alloy. You can find out the indium arsenic bond length, the gallium arsenide bond length. Not just that, XAFS can also give you the next nearest neighbor, not just the nearest neighbor, but also the distance to the next nearest neighbor. It can give you both, right? and, 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 and some, some higher as well. Right? And for that, you need a very rather intense X-ray source, which is done in things like chess and other things. Right? So you can find out the various bond lengths and you know, correlation lengths of between the material. So, uh, and uh, it's not very clear here, but essentially here's, here's an example of experimental data. The dots are experimental data, gallium arsenide, the bond length uh, uh, is, is uh, so this is D gallium arsenide, the bond length is here. And uh, if I add a very little amount of indium to gallium arsenide, maybe I'm at, say, 5% indium gallium arsenide, 5%, let's say. Right? So what it's showing is if you do a XAFS in a very low composition indium gallium arsenide alloy, what you will get is a many bonds which are gallium arsenide, which is very close to the normal gallium arsenide bond length and some bonds which are indium arsenide. So the bond lengths are closer to the individual lattice bond lengths rather than being some average. That's what it shows. Microscopically, they are closer. Do you, is that clear what we're saying? So I'm saying this A, the virtual crystal approximation, you are far from it. You know. so these bonds are closer to lattice constant of indium arsenide. These bonds are closer to lattice constant, equilibrium lattice constant of gallium arsenide. And both of them are quite far from the average, microscopically. 
that, that's what it's showing. Right? And clearly you realize then there must be quite a bit of strain, right? I mean, there's uh, microscopic strain as well, not just microscopic, but also microscopic strain. Each of these uh, crystal structures has non-zero uh, strain, you know, a, a re reasonable amount of uh, stretching and bending energies. Right? Now, so uh, uh, now uh, after we find this equilibrium position, uh, what you can do is now plug this whole thing back into your uh, strain energy and, and, and the strain energy cost now of each tetrahedron uh, comes out to be a very nice simple result and, and this, is, this will make sense. It's half, basically all strain energies, no matter how you look at it, should be half kx squared in one form or the other, right? That's where you know. And, and here what it will come out to be half and uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, uh, way of do you see what I, so essentially I calculate I'm not going through the whole derivation it's long and all that you can just plug that back in and you get this right half this is your effective k and then uh, the x is is uh, uh, I think you realize what this de delta a would be uh, this delta a here is basically uh, the essentially it's just the difference between the equilibrium lattice constants of the two individual crystals in the mass night and mass night and uh, so half k x squared, but you realize what we have done, this x, uh, the stretching, is the complete stretching, the difference, the maximum difference between the two lattice constants. Right? It's, it's, it's not the microscopic stretching. So, so the, the way it's written here is the complete stretch, uh, the complete lattice constant difference effectively between, or the bond length difference, sorry, I shouldn't say lattice constant difference. The lattice constant is d, the bond length is a, right, and, and it's the difference of the, of the, uh, Mm, of the bond lengths of the two, okay? And uh, these alpha, uh, betas, so the bars are essentially trying to average over angles and all that, but you know, this is very close to uh, what we had in this, in this uh, plot system, alphas and betas. But you see the way they appear is uh, one over two, so they appear as one over alpha plus one over beta right? times delta in our terms. Uh, and and what it means is the k that dominates. So it's like two. You can think of it as two spring constants in you know uh, connected, and and the one that you know with k one uh, or alpha and beta, right? The two two spring constant, two springs effectively in parallel, right? And the the weaker spring, you know, the floppier spring, will dominate this. It's just like resistors parallel. Right? I think you can realize that you know if, if uh, k is smaller, the x will be larger, it stretch out more, or something like that, right? So uh, to keep the same energy, so the you know the weaker or the uh, weaker bonds. Or basically, what what it really means is the betas, and what you realize is the bonding. Uh, the betas are generally smaller, you know, the bend energies are smaller than the stretch energies. I think intuitively also, probably it makes sense the bend. You know, rotational energy is, is smaller than the you know stretching energies, and and as a result, kind of somewhat counterintuitively, they dominate this this picture because they're weaker, so they dominate this picture. So uh, they dominate uh, the energy uh, cost of 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 uh, forming the uh, alloy, uh, and uh, so the end result of, of of this sort of business is 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 I just will kind of try to uh, you know in the discussion of this particular topic here. Is, is you get this uh, uh, you know half k square sort of picture. The total, uh, you know, uh, earlier when we were talking about defects and such, we uh, went through this whole picture of uh, how do you find out what is the number of defects, and for that you have to find your Gibbs free energy, and Gibbs free energy has all these terms, uh, uh, right? Uh, H minus T S, and this enthalpy of formation has E plus PV, and we said, well, PV is generally not very large, but then there's also the strain. I mean, this total energy must have also the strain cost. Right. The strain cost, energy cost of formation, and that's what we're calculating. So the strain cost of an alloy. Uh, for, for, for. The, the, and then what we actually enter here is not uh, the strain per unit bond length, but actually the uh, you know, the, so this is called the valence force field. So you have four chemical bonds, and you add, just take this multiply by four. There are four chemical bonds. So you multiply by four. This is the total uh, valence force field energy cost. Uh, valence force field, just the name, 
then you get 2 alpha beta uh, delta a naught whole squared and that's that's that that's that's what enters into the whole enthalpy argument now, basically into the bigger picture now. that's what this is the term the strain term that enters this picture and if you take this and uh, you know all the parameters now you know your alphas you know betas from, they have been tabulated for most semiconductors measured and you know your lattice constants equilibrium lattice constants that give you this a naught no, that's you know, straightforward right and you can calculate what are the this this uh, valence force field energy cost of of these uh, uh, pseudo binary or ternary alloys if you might right and here's uh, it's in a log scale for many 3 fives right? so many many alloys so you have indium phosphide arsenide gallium phosphide arsenide silicon germanium not even a 3 5 but it's compound semiconductor and all these right so uh, these are this is the, the y axis is the calculation based on the simple formulation microscopic picture right and the x-axis is the experimental data measured, right? and uh, and you can see there's you know, a reasonable, pretty reasonable, uh, you know, agreement between the two. Reasonable agreement, and uh, what you see are these lines here, which are essentially uh, uh, as you change the composition from x, you know, zero to one. So over a, over a range of compositions, you know? so and then this energy cost is very reasonable, uh, and uh, uh, in your current uh, homework and also one of your uh, sort of prelim questions uh, which is this question uh, when you read through the paper you will encounter this you know? so, so uh, in fact uh, the figures uh, somewhere down there yeah so there's a figure that shows this you know? so this is where this is where it comes from okay. okay okay so since you're going to work on it I'm not going to spend too much more time on on on, on this picture but uh, uh, is that clear so that's basically tracking strain down to the to the atoms and the bonds, right? But now what we want to do is see how the strain evolves from individual bonds to a whole layer, and then a whole lattice, uh, and uh, uh, and then how does it lead to dislocations and such things? That's what we want to do now. Is that here? Yeah. Uh, any questions at this stage? Yeah. Uh, okay, so. Uh, not uh, let's uh, go to the next topic and what we'll do now is uh, okay so I, what I'll do is uh, uh, so so uh, so the mi microscopically I think we are uh, pretty clear now that uh, the strain uh, will you know the origins of strain at least are, are, are very not, not very difficult to understand but uh, uh, once I have a layer now right so uh, so now we, we, we figured out what is the strain of a little building block of this big, bigger layer, right? And then uh, what I'm going to try to do is grow a layer of, uh, say, indium gallium arsenide or some sort of uh, an alloy. And actually, it doesn't even need to be an uh, yeah. Okay, so let's say silicon germanium on on something else. Okay, so we grow it on gallium arsenide. Yes. This is a substrate. And I want to grow a layer of indium gallium arsenide on top of this layer, and uh, uh, and I think uh, you probably have seen a lot of uh, uh, you know things like critical thickness and all that. But uh, what we're trying to do is now I want to answer the que I want to answer the question: uh, What is the strain in this layer? And I think you, you kind of know that we have already related the strain is like the lattice, its new lattice constant minus its equilibrium lattice constant divided by its equilibrium lattice constant and all that. But that is a macroscopic quantity in some sense, right? And then what we wrote down there is a microscopic quantity, right? so individual unit cells and all that. So how do you go from the, you know, uh, uh, microscopic uh, st uh, picture of strain to the whole lattice layer? And then uh, we had a certain energy cost of. Uh, uh, or rather, you know, this this um, valence force field cost of, of of each of these. So, what does it become for the whole layer? Th those are the questions we want to answer. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so uh, the moment I do this, I think you you, you realize there are uh, various kinds of strain, uh, and uh, what what will or rather. Let me explain two things. So this is a somewhat of a subtle concept, but it's actually an important one. So there will be two kinds of strain. One will be 
uh, when, I, when I try to do this, one will be what we will call as volumetric. Right? And the other is going to be what we call, what we're going to call distortional again. So some, something which borrows distortional. Uh, distortional, yeah. So this is a, a higher dimensional argument, a picture of what we said was stretching right, and bending. So now we are going to a 3D, you know, not just a point picture here anymore, but a 3D complete layer. And so we'll see there will be two kinds of stra strain energies. One is volumetric, and then I think the origins are from the from the from the stretching and the and the bending uh, pictures as well. Uh, and and the volumetric part is uh, it's interesting. So so what you can uh, uh, so this is when the volumetric part dominates when you have lattice match substrate, meaning there's no lattice mismatch at all. It's, it's, it's uh, somewhat counterintuitive that, uh, meaning I'm growing indium gallium arsenide on top of, tell me something that is, can be lattice matched to in gas. You guys should be on top of this by now. So. Indium, indium phosphide, right? So indium phosphide, you can lattice match indium phosphide to indium gallium arsenide, right? So let's say I'm growing indium gallium arsenide on indium phosphide, let's say, right? And it's actually, I've chosen, not for all compositions obviously, there are certain fixed compositions for which you can lattice match them, right? And for that, there's no lattice mismatch on the whole, right? On, 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 on the whole, there's no lattice mismatch. If you think of this as a virtual crystal, right? But microscopically, it's different. Does that make sense? I mean, microscopically, it's indium arsenide, which has a huge lattice mismatch with indium phosphide. There's gallium arsenide, some windows, which are a huge lattice mismatch with that, right? So basically, what it's now trying to say is, is uh, when you have a lattice match substrate, microscopically, you will have volumetric distortions of each of these unit cells we talked about, right? That one. So, so each of them will be microscopically stretched out, or they'll be you know, compressed. Because what it's sitting on is a very different lattice constant. This volumetric distortion of these unit cells yeah. because on a lattice match substrate. Is that clear? I mean, it's very nothing very fancy, but uh, if you think about it, it's very natural. Yes, this is what it should be. And so, in a lattice match substrate, there is uh, actually not much distortion. There's all, you know once you stretch and all that. So, if you think of this as gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, then there's not much distortional within the cell, but then they're actually connected, so there's some amount of distortion, but this dominates. That's what we're trying to say, in, if you're lattice matched. The distorted is when you are lattice mismatched, right? and you might think that volumetric will dominate, but not quite, you know, mismatched. Because here, uh, the moment you are lattice mismatched, let's say now you're growing it on you know, gallium arsenide, then uh, the picture now is uh, you have, uh, I'll draw squares now instead of cubes, uh, so, so you have, you know, indium gallium arsenide lattice constant is that, but gallium arsenide is that, right? So the whole thing gets, meaning it's not just uh, uh, one layer, but all of them, right? Uh, sorry, not unit cell, but all of them collectively are getting, you know, uh, uh, stretched uh, this way, or, or you know, some parts are obviously gallium arsenide which don't get stretched, but uh, you, you can see that this lattice constant being large on an average is getting uh, compressed this way, and, and it, 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 as a result, sorry, it, it gets compressed this way, as a result it stretches out that way, each one of them, and now you have some, some notion of distortion, right? meaning bending. I will actually make this a little more uh, uh, quantitative uh, in the next class. Uh, just in the interest of time, I want to cover something which is a result of this. But let me just uh, uh, say that uh, essentially this this uh, um, is, is related to you know bending of bonds, and this is related more to the stretching stretching of bonds. Yeah. Two different, slightly different energies, and uh, uh, and and the end result of this, and this part I'll do in the next class, uh, is 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 that uh, you know you can write the total strain down and. Uh, what you will get here is the total strain. Uh, we, we had written this also, for example, when you did piezoelectricity, you get you know the, the strain uh, uh, tensor 
we're, we're going to do this in this. And, and so there's a normal strain tensor, and then with some shear strain tensors, you know, x, y's, and all that, right, is equal to a compliance matrix with C1, 1, and, you know, C matrix times the stress tensors, right? So, uh, and, uh, right, so we I'll come to this in the next class. So essentially what I'll try to show in the next class, uh, because this may take a little bit more time, is, is how do you go from the unit cell or sorry, tetrahedra all the way to this macroscopic polarization or, or macroscopic strain components which are captured by the C's, you know, the C1s and C2s. Okay, so, right? And clearly you know that the C's have come from those alphas and betas. Right, which are the microscopic features. So we, we'll see that in the next class. Right? What I want to do now is just talk about uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll just this on on, on Wednesday. Right? So what we'll do is from here to there. On, we'll discuss on Wednesday. What I want to just uh, finish today by talking about uh, is is uh, uh, the end result of this, which will be the dislocations, just as a motivation of why we are going through all this stuff, right? Um, and and I think you, you <clears throat> so from here at, at least it should be very clear that we are, we have a layer that is strained you know and, and there's some some sort of a strain again think of it uh, as a macroscopic thing now there's some sort of a strain which is a combination of all these epsilons here right and uh, there's a, uh, so because of strain what is strain I always you always think of it as you know the stretching of a harmonic oscillator bond. That's really what it is. It's just it's stretched out compared to its equilibrium state. And therefore, there will be a cost, a energy cost of doing it. Right? This layer will be strained. And so it'll be, the energy cost will be like half kx squared sort of thing, again. Right? So in other words, the energy of straining a layer is always going to be, it's, it's basically proportional to the square of the strain. That should be. And there's something sitting in the front. Right? And we are, all this discussion is what is sitting in the front. It will be related to all these Cs. This, these compliance coefficients, right? But once you have that, uh, the uh, idea uh, is that you will, once I start growing a layer on top of another, which, where this is, this is strained, and I start increasing the thickness of the layer, right? The strain is a volumetric term, meaning, uh, rather, the strain increases with the layer thickness. So the entire layer is strained, right? So as you grow a thicker layer, it is even more strain energy, right? So it'll increase, and so essentially what we'll see is uh, uh, there that there will be one energy term that will go as some half c epsilon squared, which will increase as, with the layer thickness. This is the energy, extra energy uh, uh, that is stored in this layer because of strain. This is a you know, very generic idea, and then it's uh, you think of his mass spring system and all that. Is that clear? And that's the, uh, uh, so what, what we must have is as you increase the thickness, it, it actually, what we'll show in the next slide is it just increases with the thickness linearly. You know, that, that's how it's going to look. H is the thickness of the layer. It's going to increase. So this is the energy cost for, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, creating a strain layer of any crystal on top of another energy cost. And uh, on the other hand, if you form some sorts of defects and primary or the lowest energy excitation or the lowest energy defect you can form to release the strain will be the, what, what we call is the dislocation. So it's essentially it's a plane that's, uh, uh, sorry, okay, right. so, yeah. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, okay, this is, uh, let's not get into all the details of this. So, uh, what, what we're saying is uh, because of this is a larger lattice constant. This is, this is smaller. Uh, this is a larger. This is a smaller lattice constant, and maybe we should look at this picture. This is a little better. A larger lattice constant here, smaller lattice constant, and then what you can have is, you you have one plane where it's not registered, it's broken. So you have an extra plane of atoms or, or uh, a lattice plane here, and that's a very beginning uh, picture of a dislocation, and a dislocation will be. An extended defect, you can think of it as, uh, uh, you know, many missing uh, atoms here, meaning missing from this crystal, right? The whole plane is missing, for example, right? Or an extra plane here. You can think of it both ways. Right? And, and uh, the dislocation can be of two types. Uh, one is be mainly because of the stretching of the bonds and all that. I mean, there's, well, there are both, uh, actually, but this is the edge dislocation. 
I think you can see how, how it looks. Uh, it, it's done in a sort of periodic fashion, obviously, or in a, a lattice, but uh, you have an extra plane of atoms, so, so you have something like that, whereas this is kind of a shear, right? It, it is a, uh, so, so the break. And it's incorporate. I think, at least intuitively, you should be able to see that this is a way for the whole thing to release strain. It's breaking along a certain you know, point. But it's really not breaking because you have broken very few bonds. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, internally, these are all still com chemically bonded. There's no breaking, broken bond there. So, yeah. so wh what are we saying is, uh, as the energy or cost of strain increases, what is the lowest excitation of breaking bonds and all that that can allow you to counter that? You know, what will lower the energy of the system? Right? And that's that the, the lowest energy excitation to counter this increase in the strain energy is what we call as dislocation. I mean, that's really what it is. And physically, these are the manifestations of the dislocation in a 3D crystal and all this. You have threading, uh, you have edge dislocation, screw dislocation, all kinds of other things, right? So, uh, and what we'll see that, uh, for that is, is essentially the, the uh, energy cost for, or the energy lowering by formation of a dislocation, let's say, of, of, of a certain length L, right? Uh, uh, will will actually uh, depend on strain, of course, uh, and uh, it will uh, uh, depend on, on, on strain as a epsilon, and there will be a function of h and, and some constant, let's say, b here. Right? This will be the lowering. And we'll see that it will be of this form, some function of the, uh, of the thickness of the, or the length of the dislocation, if you might. Right? If, if a dislocation is going this way, the length is h. If it's going at this way, there's cosine theta times h or something like that, right? It's at an angle. So, but the length of the, so the, there's the energy lowering per unit length of the dislocation. And that's what we're kind of writing here. And then, and, and, and there's the strain. So what you do is, is uh, to find the critical thickness is, uh, so essentially what we'll see is this term as a function of h, the, the strain energy cost is going up linearly with h. Right? And uh, uh, whereas this one uh, will actually, we'll see, it'll, it'll change logarithmically. Right? It'll change logarithmically, uh, and this is a lowering of the energy, so it will kind of something like that maybe, right? And what we'll find is uh, there is a critical thickness, obviously, where beyond which, uh, so so beyond which you you you, it's more energetically uh, favorable for for the crystal to form a dislocation rather than be st remain strained. It, it can lower its energy by forming dislocation. That that's what we'll see in the next class. Okay? Uh, but what I want to do is kind of just go over a couple of things about dislocations right now uh, and, and, and then just say that, uh, uh, by the way, I have to leave a little early today, maybe five more minutes, okay? So, uh, 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 so what I want to say is uh, the kinds of dislocations and all, we'll talk about this, them a little later. Uh, in the next class, what we'll do is map uh, the dislocation problem to uh, another problem which many of you are probably very well aware of, which is uh, you can think of dislocation as point charges and do electrostatic laws to figure out how they move, whether they attract each other, whether they repel, uh, how fast they can diffuse. Uh, because what we'll see is the, the, the equations that govern the energetics and the motion of dislocations are exactly the same as that govern uh, the motion of charges in classical electromagnetic theory. It's pretty much the same. I mean. You can map the problem, and then you can think of dislocations completely in that fashion. The other very interesting thing about, this dis about dislocations are, are that they are uh, very interesting topological objects. You know, basically, uh, um, you know, so the, uh, the, the, for example, if you look at the screw dislocation, if you're walking around a lattice constant, right, so, so you, you go around the origin, or the, this is the axis of the dislocation of the bro broken bonds. And you walk around it, and when you come back, you're on the next upper plane. You're not in the same plane when you do a two pi rotation. I think you know that that's, that's like a spinner uh, in, in quantum mechanics, where you rotate the spin, it doesn't come back to itself, you're in some other angle, you know, minus one and all that. Exactly the same thing. So the properties are very interesting. Uh, uh, for example, a screw this is a screw dislocation. Is this an example of a screw dislocation at surface uh, AFM? Each of these is an atomic step. 
And I think what you can see is that basically if you walk around, you, you are up in the next plane now, atomic plane and all that. So this is on silicon carbide. And it's one of the very popular wide band gap semi compound semiconductors. Uh, and uh, um, the, what we'll see uh, in the next class is also there are strain fields associated with it. You know, as you go away from the center of the dislocation, the strain field goes as the epsilon, as you go away from the center of the dislocation, it will go as 1 over r, dk as 1 over r. Sometimes it will be decorated with some sort of a sine theta factor which has an angular dependence and all that. But if you just for a second forget that, this will map it to the potential term of a charge, you know, Coulomb potential of a charge, like that. Right? So, so we map it to that. And then you can kind of correlate a lot of things from there. So that's one thing about uh, these locations. And, uh, and the second thing I want to say is, uh, the last thing I want to say today is, is that the, uh, Sorry, one more. <laughs> so the dislocation has to have a source and a, and a sink, meaning uh, uh, dislocation typically won't vanish in 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 in, in, in a isotopological object. It it cannot. Uh, what we'll see is it can end uh, on surfaces or at interfaces. You know, you cannot end it abruptly in the middle of a crystal. So so that's a very important parameter of our dislocations uh, as well, uh, uh, think about dislocation. The last thing is, is uh, because of dislocations, you actually have a lot of, uh, it, it kind of heavily influences growth dynamics itself, the growth of the crystal. If you're growing a crystal, let's say, of silicon carbide, let's say, right, and you're growing it, and then imagine you are trying to land atoms here, right, on a very atomically flat surface with no dislocation, no defects, you know, the atomically flat surface, let's say, and then the atom, can only form one chemical bond to the one below it. Right? So only one chemical bond, right? And then you try to nucleate many of them, and then the ones in the middle now can form, you know, four in the plane and one below, so it's five. So it can lower its energy even more now, right? If you form this way, right? But it turns out the probability of atoms landing, and we are going to do this uh, in the in maybe next week or something like that. The probability when we talk about growth after these dislocations, uh, the probability of Forming a cluster is not very high. You know, if you look at the flux and the number of sites and all that, it's very low chance that you can form a cluster like this. On the other hand, uh, do you see? I mean, what you're saying is, it would, if you have a cluster like this, the growth will go okay because now the atoms come in, and if they are at the at the edge here, they can lower its energy quite a bit more than if it were just landing on a flat surface, right? If it was one bond here, it can form five or four bonds, right? Whereas if you have a dislocation like this, let's say it's a screw dislocation, right? You see right, right away that there are so many additional sites here that it can come and chemically bond. And in fact, when, when the growth occurs, the atoms land here, and it's very interesting, the dynamics of it, it will increase, it will grow faster you know, as you get away from it, so it will start curving and start you know, circling, and, and this is exactly what that is. This, the growth is decorated by, a, uh, or rather, the growth dynamics is controlled by these for example, screw dislocation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, so I think the one of the origins of the name dislocation. Anybody knows? Or, yeah. well, it's just a name, but uh, I think the idea is. I mean, this is you know in the parking lot as well. If you the idea is if you walk around a loop, you expect to be in the same place, but you're in a different location. So so it's a, and that's really the origin of the name uh, that you are. Uh, uh, you know, dislocated in a similar way in the edge dislocation, you are coming back, you know, walk, uh, you know, five miles north, five miles east, west, south, and then you're not at the same place anymore. Right? So, so that means something is curved somewhere. Right? There's a curvature somewhere, and, and, and then this is the origin of the word. Okay, so, so uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, the last part of it was a little qualitative, but at least you get an idea of what we are going to cover next. We are going to take the microscopic picture that we talked about, map it to the macroscopic picture, and do, uh, I, uh, to, uh, then I'll map the dislocation problem to the electrostatic problem, and then you can do a lot of very interesting things with it. You know, talk about dynamics of dislocation and you know, uh, effect on electronic properties and all that stuff. So we will talk about that in the next class on Wednesday. Okay, good. Thank you.